Well, hello, and may God bless each and every one of you. God bless you, and thank you so much for being with us today on Wednesday uh, afternoon Bible study with Pastor James. Today, we're coming online uh, with you as we continue on in the wonderful book of the study of the book of Exodus. Uh, I tell you, we went through a couple of years study in the book of Genesis, which was quite enlightening to us, and uh, we decided to go through Genesis 2. <laughs> Part two, which is called the book of Exodus. So uh, we, we will today be starting uh, Exodus, the seventh chapter, uh, and uh, continuing on in our study uh, with Moses, as Moses and Aaron have gone back to Egypt uh, by command of God from the burning bush experience when God told Moses, it is time for my people to be set free. I've heard their cry. I've seen their tears. And uh, I tell you, something happens when God's people come together as one in prayer. Uh, it moves the heart of God like nothing uh, else will. And uh, Moses and Aaron have gone back to Egypt. And uh, we started stopped last week with the beginning of the ten plagues. The beginning of the ten plagues. So we're going to continue on with that particular study. Let's have prayer. And then we're going to dive right into the scriptures uh, for our online Wednesday afternoon Bible study today. Father God, in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we come before your presence, first of all, to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for being our Abba, our Father, our Creator, our Sustainer, our God, our El Shaddai, the All-Sufficient One. You are God, and besides you, there's none other. We give you glory and honor, Lord God, for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for the blood of Jesus, for the name of Jesus, for the sacrifice of love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, by dying on Calvary's cross for the sins of the world, for our sins, not his, but for ours. Uh, what manner of love is this? For you said in your word in St. John three sixteen, for you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. We're thankful, Lord God, for uh, the continued ministry of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As the writer of the book of Hebrews says, as our justifiable high priest who sits on your right hand, we're grateful, Lord, for the wonderful body of Christ, the ecclesia that we call the church, and we're grateful to be a part of it. We're grateful, Lord, for the Holy Spirit that leads and guides us and directs us, brings back to remembrance the former things of which you have said, guides us into all truth, empowers us, and comforts us. And I'm so grateful for everyone who dedicates their time uh, for the study of the Word of God, uh, especially on Wednesdays as we come together in unity and fellowship and as one uh, at 11 o'clock a.m. as well as at 630 online. And I ask that you touch and bless everyone for their dedication and their faithfulness in the Bible and the study of your Word. We love you and we say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. All right, we're going to dive right into the study, uh, all those who come to Bible study at 11 o'clock uh, on Wednesday in person, uh, you will have the uh, PowerPoint uh, as you are going through this particular study, so you can follow uh, with the Bible uh, with the PowerPoint study, uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. If I don't have your email address, then you can follow us the old-fashioned way. <laughs> by having your Bibles uh, with us. Now, along with your Bibles, I'm also going to ask you to have something to write with and something to write on. It's so important when we do Bible studies or even on Sunday morning or whatever time you or day you may worship the Lord in a corporate sense that not only you, not only you list hearers of the word, but that you're students of the word. Uh, whatever that preacher may say, that pastor, whoever it might be, that you're taking notes on what they're saying, the scriptures that they're using, and then in your own time, in your own personal study, going back and reviewing and reading and studying those verses and chapters that was given to you through a Bible study or on a Sunday morning message. Amen. Just don't take a person's word for it. You need, to, you need to know the word of God for yourself. So grab your Bibles. Once again, something to write with and something to write on. So we're going to go by way of quick review. Uh, last week, we stopped at Exodus 7, 6, and 7. If you see my eyes veering off, it's because I'm reading uh, from the scriptures. 
uh, Exodus 7, the 7th chapter, 6 and the 7th verse, and I'm reading out the NLT, says something that I think is so important to all of us as Christians, no matter what age we may be, no matter how advanced in age we might be or how young we might be in age, this scripture holds great credence. And it says, so Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded them. Seventh verse says, Moses was 80 years old and Aaron was 83 when they made their demands to Pharaoh. Isn't that beautiful? Here you have two men uh, in what we would consider to be advanced age, praise the Lord, and, uh, uh, and here they're still working for the Lord. They are still on a mission, praise the Lord. And this mission just didn't end at this particular time. Forty years passed and they were still around. Lord have mercy. But I hear so many people that I talk to and they say, well, you know, I, I'm too old now. Uh, God can't really use me. I, I really... I really can't do anything for the kingdom. Uh, you know, I, I don't run as fast as I used to. I, I can't walk as briskly as I used to or as long as I used to. Uh, I've already done uh, my bid for God and country. And, I, you know, I just think I'm too old, too old for God to use me. I, 80 years old, Moses, 83 years old, Aaron. And here they are on a mission of God. It's never too late. And you are never too old, nor are you ever too young to work for the Lord. Now, Exodus 7, 8, 9, and 10 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, we're just doing a quick review. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Pharaoh would demand, show me a miracle. When does, uh, when he said, in other words, the Lord has said, uh, when he does this, say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down in front of Pharaoh, and it will become a serpent. God is preparing uh, Moses and Aaron for what's about to happen. In the 10th verse it says, So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did what the Lord had commanded them. Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a serpent. Now, this is equally important because I've been guilty of this one myself. In preaching sometime or teaching this lesson, we'll have the tendency, tendency to say, well, Moses took his staff and threw it down and it became a serpent. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says Aaron took was the one who threw his staff down, and it became a serpent. That's what God told uh, Moses to tell Aaron to do. Don't forget, in our previous study, God had told Moses, I am going to send you before Pharaoh as a god, little g, and Aaron as your priest, praise the Lord, your partner. You're going to be... To, in the eyes of Pharaoh and to the Egyptians, a little g, a god, not not God, but a little g, God, in their eyesight, in their natural and carnal perspective, and Aaron is going to be like your priest. Uh, so Aaron was tasked to do the work as Moses was the oracle, the, the voice of the Lord as God spoke to him, God spoke to Pharaoh, and then God would speak to Aaron. So once again, they're before Pharaoh. Uh, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. The plagues are starting, uh, about to start. And uh, God tell Moses, uh, Pharaoh demanded a sign, show me something. You saying, God, your God sent you to tell me to release. Keep in mind, the command that God gave Pharaoh, uh, Moses to ask Pharaoh was not to free the people of God. Totally. He said, let my people go into the desert for three days, and to worship me for those three days. That's what God told Moses to tell Pharaoh. Pharaoh wouldn't even do that. Now, later on, it got to the point where Moses said, let my people go. It's time to let them go. But in the beginning, it was let the people go into the desert to fellowship or to worship him for three days. You know, before I move on, I got to say this. One of the things that I'm going to really be working on and look, I, I've been, I, the church has been a part, I've been in the church, and church has been in me uh, for over 50 years. And uh, uh, one of the things that I never could understand, why during a, a religious observances, spiritual observances, for those of the saints of God, the believers, disciples of Jesus Christ, why we got to beg to get that time off, or we got to take sick time, or a vacation day, or something like that, when every other religion, when it when it is time, 
for them to observe uh, their, their religious festivals or observances, no problem. When it comes to Christians, we got to beg and, 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 and make deals. You know, we just, we just went through Good Friday and uh, observant, observance. And uh, I, I can't tell you how many people told me, well, I, I wanted to come to Good Friday service, but I couldn't get the day off. <laughs> well, I wanted to come to Good Friday service, but I don't have any more vacation time. You know, my company would, you know, it's time to stop that foolishness. Uh, when, when we need a day off to observe or to celebrate or to worship our God through one of the observances, we should be able to get that time off. Okay, I'm done. Let me move on. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Exodus 7, 11, and 13, then Pharaoh called his own wise men and sorcerers, and these Egyptian magicians did the same thing with their magic. They threw down their staffs, which also became serpents, but then Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. <laughs> I have no idea what kind of serpent that the magicians of Pharaoh's staffs become, but obviously uh, uh, Aaron's staff was an anaconda. <laughs> <laughs> it ate up the rest of the snakes, praise the Lord. God will never be outdone. Uh, 13 verse says, uh, says, Pharaoh's heart, however, remained hardened. Uh, he still refused to listen, just as the Lord had told Moses and Aaron would happen. Now, I, I want to focus on, on another area here, uh, because we're going to see this as a theme continuing to some of the plagues, where Moses would tell Aaron what to do, and Aaron would do it, and the plague would take place. And then Pharaoh would command his Egyptian magicians, just as he did there, here, to do the same thing. And some of these plagues were horrible to the degree that one would ask, why would after Aaron would perform these miracles of these plagues, why would, in the world would Pharaoh turn around and say, well, okay, to my magicians, you do the same. And this went on for the first few plagues until the plague of lice came. And uh, Pharaoh's magicians couldn't duplicate that. But I just thought it was silly. You know, when the water turned to blood, the rest, whatever water was left, his magicians turned that water to blood. I'm like, that's stupid. You know, you, you already lost all your drinking water and you're going to lose the rest of it. But anyway, this is what sin would make you insane. Uh, iniquity would drive you crazy. And when we look at some of the things that's taking place in the world today, the Bible warned us that the day would come when right would be looked upon as wrong and wrong would be looked upon as right. And Lord have mercy. If this 21st century has manifested that, I don't know what else it has. Exodus 7, 14 and 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. He still refuses to let the people go. So go to Pharaoh in the morning. As he goes down to the river, the what river? The river now. Stand on the bank of the now river and meet him there. Be sure to take along the staff that turned into a snake. Make sure you take the staff that Aaron is carrying with you. Then announce to him in the 16th verse, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to tell you, let my people go so they can worship me in the wilderness. Keep in mind, God's original plan was three days, or at least that's what he told Moses to tell Pharaoh. The whole plan was to get the people out of Egypt totally. But he knew Pharaoh's heart would be hard. He'd say, so I'm just asking for three days. And he knew Pharaoh wasn't going to do that. And so now you have refused to listen to, to him. Listen to him. God. God is speaking through Moses. Moses is speaking to Aaron, speaking to Pharaoh. Amen. It's so important. I want you ministers, you preachers, that's watching me because I'm putting this out on all of our social media platforms. It's not you. Stop saying I. Stop saying I did this, me. No, it's God. The only reason there's a you is because of God. The only reason there's a me and the only reason that I can call myself minister, elder, pastor, whatever, the only reason I can say I am that I am is because of God and God's calling on my life and your life. I don't care if you're a chaplain, elder, minister, pastor, bishop, overseer, uh, uh, bishop, apostle to the third power, doctor, apostle, bishop. I don't care what your title is. You are only because God is. Never forget that. 
I don't care how small your ministry is, how large your ministry is, how, how much outreach you have in your ministry. The only reason we are in this place and the only reason we do what we do is by the will and the favor, hallelujah, and the power of God. So get I out of your vocabulary. The only time you should, the I should be in the vocabulary of any Christian is that I praise God. I worship my creator. I love you, Jesus. I love you, my heavenly father. That's the only time we should ever use I. <laughs> I praise the Lord. Exodus 7, 17 and 18. Just going to quick review. So this is what the Lord says. I will show you that I am the Lord. Look, I will strike the water of the Nile with this staff in my hand, and the river will turn to blood. Amen. This is the conversation that Moses is having with Pharaoh on the bank of the Nile River. 18 verse says, the fish in it will die and the river will stink. The Egyptians would not be able to drink any water from the Nile. Amen. The 17th verse, 19th and 20th, I apologize, 7th chapter, 19th and 20th verse says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, take your staff and raise your hand over the waters of Egypt, all its rivers, canals, ponds, and all the reservoirs. Turn all the water to blood everywhere in Egypt, and the water will turn to blood, even the water stored in the wooden bowls and stone pots. And, Mo and so Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. As Pharaoh and all of his officials watched, Aaron raised his staff and struck the water of the Nile. Suddenly the whole river turned to blood. Amen. The whole river turned to blood. And as God said, the fish in the river died and the water became so foul that the Egyptians couldn't drink it. There was blood everywhere throughout the land of Egypt. Amen. Now the 22nd verse, here we go. It just shows you the silliness of sin and disobedience to God. But again, the magicians of Egypt used their magic and they too turned the water into blood. So Pharaoh's heart remained hard. He refused to listen to Moses and Aaron just as the Lord had predicted. I go back to what I said earlier. Moses and Aaron through the power of God, has already turned all the water in the, the water in the Nile River <laughs> to blood. And the Bible says, as we just read, not just in the Nile River, but it's, it's rivers, the canals, the ponds, and all the reservoirs, the water that was stored in wooden bowls and in and stone pots. So everywhere there was water, it was turned to blood. And, of course, it began to stink. It was foul. Oh, I can't even imagine the smell that must have been uh, going forth throughout the land of Egypt at this particular time. Uh, because of this, all the fish died. And Moses in his disobedience, uh, I apologize, Pharaoh in his disobedience <laughs> commanded his magicians to turn the rest of the water into blood. So the people already don't have any drinking water now or water to wash with. And whatever water was left, they turned the blood themselves. There is silliness and disobedience. My God. Exodus 7, 23, 25, Pharaoh returned to his palace and put the whole thing out of his mind. Here's what happened with the people. Then all the Egyptians dug around the riverbank to find drinking water so they couldn't drink the water from the Nile. <laughs> seven days passed from the time the Lord struck the Nile. So this lasted for seven days where the people was actually digging in the ground, trying to find clear water, pure water to drink out of. Lord have mercy. So let's get to today's lesson. Today, uh, we, we're going to start for the rest of the time I have left. Chapter 8 of Exodus. Turn your Bibles. Get your Bibles. Turn to chapter 8. And uh, uh, this chapter title is The Manifestation of God's Power Continues. So this is a continuation of the ten plagues. We just read the first one, which was the water turning into blood. Now, let's continue. Exodus 8, 1 and 3. We're now about to go to the second plague. Then the Lord said to Moses, go back to Pharaoh and announce him. Keep in mind, Pharaoh has gone back to his palace and, you know, just kind of woosahed. Okay, you know, okay, they did what they did. My Egyptians were able to duplicate it. Not looking at the suffering of, of his own people, you know, but yeah, sometimes leaders don't care. <laughs> be, be mindful of that. Go back to Pharaoh and announce to, to him, 
This is what the Lord says. Let my people go so they can worship me. Amen. Let them go so they can worship me. And if you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs across your entire land. Plague two. Pharaoh, according to what Moses told him, if you don't let my God's people go, another plague is coming. You, in other words, you thought the water turning to blood and the now and to everywhere else was terrible. God is saying, I'm about to send some frogs. And uh, we ain't talking about frog leg dinner either. Third verse says, the Nile River will swarm with frogs. They will come. I want you to listen to this. Whew. They will come up out of the river and into your palace, even into your bedroom, and unto your bed. They will enter the houses of your officials and your people. They will even jump into your ovens and your kneading bowls. My God. In other words, Pharaoh, everywhere throughout Egypt, there will be frogs. There will be frogs when you try to go to sleep. There's going to be frogs when you try to wake up in the morning. There's going to be frogs when you try to take a bath, when you try to bathe. There's going to be frogs no matter when you try to sit down and eat. There's going to be frogs in the palace, in the houses of your officials, and in the houses and the homes of everybody. Or as the old folks used to say, those blessed age, back in the day when I was growing up in church, everybody is going to have to deal with frogs. You know, when I was a little boy growing up, there was a movie, <laughs> older movie called Frogs. And frogs in this island had just taken the whole island over, killed everybody, and had taken the island over. This was a prelude to that movie, Frogs. Exodus 8, 4, and 6. We're in the eighth chapter of Exodus now. Frogs will jump on you, your people, and all your officials. In other words, it's not just going to be the frogs jumping around everywhere you go, but the frogs going to be jumping on you too. Amen. Can you imagine that? I, just let your, cre- let your creative mind, let the creative energy in your psyche, your subconscious and conscious mind, just run wild for a moment. And wherever you live, whatever city, township, village, you, a county you may live in, that everywhere you go, there's just a multitude of frogs, millions of frogs in your home, in every room of your house. When you walk outside, frogs. When you go to the restaurant, frogs. When you, wherever you go, frogs. And not just frogs, but the frogs are just leaping all over you too. This, oh, Lord, this is terrible. This is a horror movie right here. Fifth verse of the eighth chapter of Exodus. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, raise the staff in your hand over all the rivers, canals, ponds of Egypt, and bring up frogs all over the land. And Aaron raised his hand over the waters of Egypt, and frogs came up and covered the whole land. We're, we're seeing in these first two plagues an entire shifting of the ecosystem. Uh, science has already told us and proven, proven there's more insects and animals than there are people on this planet. Uh, in God's infinite love and wisdom, he's caused that separation uh, where uh, the insects and the animals uh, stay in their place. Uh, there was a time we stayed in ours, <laughs> but that's changed. And uh, in, the, in, the, in the ecosystem work. Uh, this is a shifting of that ecosystem where the frogs are no longer staying in the marshlands and in the rivers and in the, in the lakes and uh, in the canals and the ponds. The frogs are now coming out and they're coming on dry land. And they are, this is an invasion basically. So Egypt was invaded by frogs. Now, I said it again. I'm a, I said it once. I'm going to say it again. The ignorance and the silliness of disobedience. Exodus 8 and 7 says, but the, magicians of, but the magicians of Pharaoh were able to do the same thing with their magic. They too caused frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. I mean, help me out here. 
I, I'm at a loss. I really am of understanding the logic behind this. You got frogs, as I just stated, all over the place. Frogs jumping all over you. And just because of your disobedience and to try to prove yourself right or stronger than God, you turn around and do the same thing. I, I, I don't get it. And, we're, and what's, so, what's so terrible, we're saying the same thing today. We're saying the same thing today. Mankind refuses to say Jesus Christ is Lord. Mankind refuses to say God, there's only one God. And he is El Shaddai. He is Jehovah. He is God Almighty, the Father Almighty. We refuse it's from a general, universal sense of mankind to accept God as who he is. A and we're doing everything we can. I mean, all this new technology, and thank God for technology. I, I am not one of those individuals who fight against technology. How, how hypocritical would that be for me to sit here using technology and to fight against technology? <laughs> It would make no sense. Amen. However, they, they turn around and, do, and we're seeing the same thing. In the Garden of Eden, according to the Genesis account, when the enemy said, he knows the day you eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will not die, but you shall be like God's knowing the difference between good and evil. Man has been chasing that rabbit, chasing that carrot ever since. Ever since. And instead of just saying, Jesus is Lord. Man continues to try to duplicate what God has done in refusal and disobedience to God, and it ends up in silliness. Praise the Lord. Exodus 8 and 8 says, Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron. Here we go. Now we're beginning to see a shifting here. Two plagues have just taken place, right? River, the now uh, river where water is turned to blood, and now the plague of frogs, the invasion of frogs. Exodus 8 and 8 says, Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and begged, pleaded with the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people. I will let your people go so they can offer sacrifices to the Lord. So we're beginning to see a shifting here. Okay? Uh, God knew Pharaoh's heart would stay hard. But we're beginning to see the chinks now, the clinks and, and the chain, the weakest link of that chain. As they say, the, the chain is only as strong as, as strong as its weakest link. And we're beginning to see that chain begin to shake a little bit. Uh, but once again, what we've saw thus far is arrogance based on ignorance, fighting against God. We're beginning to see a breakthrough, but, but don't shout now uh, because the breakthrough is not complete. The scripture says in Exodus 8, 9, and 10, Moses replied, you set the time. Tell me when you want me to pray for you. I love the confidence of Moses. Moses knew through trial and tribulation and testing of God, Moses knew, hallelujah, thank you, Lord, that his Redeemer liveth. Moses knew that the Lord God Almighty would not leave him nor forsake him. Moses knew that there is power in God. Listen to his confidence here. Tell me when you want me to pray for you and your officials and your people. Then you and your houses will be rid of the frogs. They will remain in the Nile River. Pharaoh's response was, do it tomorrow. Moses' response, all right. It will be as you have said. Then you will know that there is no one like the Lord our God. Father in heaven name in heaven's name, that should be the testimony of every born again believer, of every saint of God, of every disciple of Jesus Christ. There is none like our God. Stop compromising. Stop trying stop going along to get along. Just tell your faith. Speak your faith. If somebody doesn't agree, okay, fine. But my, my experience and my faith is there's none other like our God. Hallelujah. The world's going to bow down before him anyway. The scripture says, uh, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Praise the Lord. 
Exodus 8 and, 8 and 11 through 13. The frogs will leave you in your houses, your officials, and your people, and they will remain only in the Nile River. So Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh's palace, and Moses cried out to the Lord about the frogs he had inflicted on Pharaoh, the invasion. And the Lord did just what Moses had predicted. The frogs in the houses, the courtyards, and the fields all died. So this invasion of frogs uh, that came upon the land of Egypt, who knows, millions, millions of frogs. Who, who, we, we don't have a count. I, I'm throwing the term million out there, but I, I really have no biblical uh, definitive proof it was in the millions. But what I do know, it was enough that it invaded the entire land of Egypt. Hello, hello. So that's a lot of frogs. Thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions. Uh, I really don't care. It was just a lot of frogs. And they died. Exodus 8, 14, 15, and 16. The Egyptians piled them into great heaps and a terrible stench filled the land. <laughs> of course it did. You got dead animals. And the, the, the fact that it was enough to invade the whole land, once again, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, who knows, but it stunk up the entire land. 15th verse. Remember Pharaoh said, I beg you, get rid of the frogs. I promise I'll let the people go. He, 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 he made a word. And when a leader said something, people expected it to be done. But listen to the 15th verse. That's why as a church, we, get, we can't get so excited and happy with a promise. I want you to listen to me. We can't get so excited and happy because of promises. We, we need to see action. We need to see action. But when Pharaoh, 15th verse, but when Pharaoh saw that relief had come, he became stubborn again. In other words, his heart hardened again. He refused to listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had told him. Now, I want to repeat that 